Jan. Yan, kamusta kay Jan, mga kameta? Mag-lifetime, mabilisan. Mukhang wala naman tao dito. Mga masyado tayong magagayin kasi di natin alam kung mahabol natin mamayang gabi on time. So sabi ko, habol ko ito. Um, eto na guys, eto na. So nung Saturday, pinag-usapan natin na uh, uh, the, yung Senate race. At sino yung mga number one dyan? Of course, sabi natin, by a significant margin, si Erwin Tulfo Apo ay number one sa Senate as far as you know, pre-election service or concerns. Of course, uh, things could still change. Nakita natin last time na number one si Rafi Tulfo for the Senate sa service until na Robin Hood siya. Na Robin Hood Padilla siya. Uh, and then we said na yung isa pang interesting dun sa pre-election survey na nakita natin sa Pulse Asia is itong uh, posibilidad na not one but two Tulfos may join the other Tulfos there. So, um, theoretical, there could be up to three Tulfos dyan sa, sa Senado. At uh, that would be a totally different scenario if ever that happens. Marami na tayo nagkaroon ng mag-inam, de Villiers, magkapatid, de Caetanos, ayan, yung mga magkapatid din na iba, the good one, the not so good one, yung mga sila JV or Hersito, at yung, uh, yung kapatid niya. So marami tayong mga ganon. Ang hindi, hindi pa, ang hindi pa nangyari sa ating minamahal na bayan, ang ating pinaka-high level na demokrasya sa mundo, ay itong posibilidad na tatlong kapatid ang uh, magkakaroon ng pwesto dyan sa Senado. And this is interesting because the Senate is supposed to be a bastion of independence. The Senate is supposed to be our most august, highest chamber of our legislature. Uh, the Senate in many ways is supposed to be the clash of titans, the, the breeding ground, um, the, oh, is that correct? Uh, the, 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 the platform for future presidential balls or, or where the future presidents of the country could be trained. So at least yun yung historical na pagtingin natin sa Senado. But yun nga, eto na, the, based on the service, we're saying there could be up to three Tulfos if both Ben and Erwin win. Si Erwin, hindi lang siya shoo-in, he's increasingly cementing his position as the number one senator for 2025 elections. But again, as I said, maybe the surprise that happened, baka magkaroon na naman ng Robin Hood Padilla effect sa next year's elections. Now, the other thing we have to also look at is the presidential survey is the presidential sorry guys my my bata my guy there's a presidential survey at ito na na confirm yung sinasabi ko actually my source is another authoritative survey hindi ko lang sabihin anong, anong survey agency yan na uh, sinabi natin the other month pa lang na si Rafi Tulfo po ay ahead of Sara Duterte yeah. not for one quarter but actually two quarters and this was already a month ago and now, potentially, we could see a situation where Rafi Tulfo will be ahead of Sara Duterte for multiple quarters, more than one quarter. Although, pag tingin ko dun sa ibang survey sa... Ay, unti ko sinabi tuloy ano yung survey dyan. Kasi confidential sinabi sa akin. Medyo mas malayo yung agwat. Dito sa nakita natin survey ngayon... Sorry, na-distract ako sa bata. Munti ako na ano... Munti... <laughs> munti ko binoking yung mga <laughs> sources natin. Mamawalan tayo ng ano dyan. Yan, so na-confirm na po. Na na con- na confirm na po. Na na con- na confirm na po ang uh, itong sinasabi natin na si Rafi Tulfo na po ang number 1. All right, to 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 to. Number 1 na po ang si Senator Rafi Tulfo sa Pulse Asia survey. So at least I know now two authoritative surveys whereby hindi na si hindi na Sara all. Hindi na Sara all. Um Ano na, tool for all na. Actually, maganda na yan. Tool for all na, hindi na Sara all. So, while two tool for are pasok dun sa top, sa Magic 12, and at least one of them is in a very good position to top the race next year, um, balito ka nga, yung isa pang kapatid na kuya nila, baka may balak din, hindi ko lang paano nila ikasya, yung marami yan. But, um, here, as far as Rafi tool for is concerned, I mean, personally, sa tingin ko, he has been doing very, very well sa Senate. As I said, I've been historically quite skeptical of the Tulfos for reasons that you can uh, check. And dami na mga podcast with Leloy, with, with Ronald, with, with Mark Gamboa. And dami na mga, mga vlog series on the Tulfos. Um, but in fairness, you have to be fair. You have to be fair. You know, when when, when you see the performance of the person, uh, alam ko na, ayan, may hurt na naman yung mga, mga DDS na kasama natin dyan. Huwag naman sa akin na kayo ma-hurt. Alam ko naman na-hurt kayo kasi natalo yung manok nyo. At alam ko na-hurt lang kayo dahil <laughs> hindi na DDS yung may ibang kasama nyo ngayon. Okay, now now going back to Rafi Tulfo. In fairness to the guy, I mean the way he walked out on Bato, 
when Bato obviously was not doing a proper job in terms of holding certain people accountable, when Bato was lawyering for certain people that he should not have lawyered, when Bato was not doing his job as a senator, a clueless naman daw talaga. I mean, sabi niya clueless sa maraming bagay. But anyway, um, nag-walk out siya dun sa Cynthia Villar issue. Uh, no one dare to to talk about yung mga alam niya na alam niya na oh, si si Rafi lang nagkaroon ng tapang na ganun now obviously we expected him to be more vocal dun sa issue ni Kiboloy but at the very least ang ginawa niya is he voted uh, you know in the right direction right uh, at hindi niya ginawa yung mga ginawa nila Robin Hood Padilla among others now i can go on and on also dun sa issue ng Depet, yung mga kakulangan sa depet. Uh, and, and I think what, one thing that is very interesting with Rafi Tulfo is that he did not engage in direct attacks on Sara Duterte. If anything, when there was a lot of attacks on Sara Duterte on the confidential fund issue, on the West Philippines issue, among others, si Rafi Tulfo hindi nakialam. So that actually shows you a, a certain degree of strategic astuteness because he's choosing his battle and he doesn't want to come off as if he's preempting the 2020 elections. He's not. Uh, he's trying to make sure that he doesn't come off as if he's grandstanding for 2020 elections. Even though alam ko marami mga kadidiyas natin, may ibang vloggers na kasama natin dyan, yan ang accusation nila kay Rafi Tulfo. But you know, what's grandstanding to, to yung mga haters or grandstanding dun sa mga natatamaan is actually, you know, proactive, proactive intervention. Um, now, the other thing that actually was interesting also with Rafi Tulfo over the past year or so is also in interventions in behalf of the Philippine national security. Not only hindi siya nag, uh, I love you China, hindi siya nag protect me China. No, he also questioned yung presence ng China sa ating critical infrastructure, particularly, particularly dun sa grid natin, national grid natin. So I think that's a very, very important thing. Now, as I said, we can have a long conversation about Tulfos, including Rafi Tulfo. Um, I asked him during our interview about due process, how the Tulfo method sometimes, to put it mildly, may not necessarily um, jive on sa ating conceptions uh, of, you know, you know, the, you know, having the 100% compliance with due process and all. He had his explanation for that, so please check that out. But let me tell you this, way, this thing. I find it extremely hypocritical for certain people who supported the former president, who openly called for what is tantamount to AJK, uh, I find people who openly supported a deadly drug war dun sa dating uh, presidente, I find it super hypocritical and questionable for people who supported a president in the past who openly questioned the Constitution, openly questioned the Supreme Court, openly called for overthrow of our democratic process to suddenly come out now and be anti tulfo because suddenly they are holding uh, you know holding up the cudgels for for rule of law i'm sorry wala kay moral ascendancy whatsoever okay and let's be absolutely clear um while i may have some concerns with the inartful ways by which people like rafi tulfo perhaps deal with uh, uh issues of justice uh among others and there were mistakes i think it's pretty clear to us there sometimes na imejo the way they handled the shows and mga major Michael, but that but never sila na call for EJK, never sila na openly call for defiance of the constitution. At base sa alam natin, actually Rafi Tulfo has been working with different mayors, including progressive mayors like Vigo Soto, to help you mga tao na may pangangailangan pagdating sa ostesya. So let let me be absolutely clear about that. Now having said that, I think mahalaga na uh, na bigyan natin ng pansin, no? Um, Bakit ang daming tao uh, sa tingin nila, uh, mga tulfos are the, are the future? In fact, they're not the future, they're already the present. In many ways, they're already they're already here. I mean, they're already a political force to reckon with. And of course, there's some also asking a question, na, 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 bagong dynasty ba to or something. But but before that, let, let's just first look at the numbers. I think the numbers are very interesting. Before we look at the whole sociological phenomenon behind the rise of the tulfos, uh, uh, let's look at the numbers. I think that's that's very important because at least the Pulse Asia numbers, the race is quite close. All right, the race is quite close. But it's the sub -demog the demographics where things get very very interesting. So just to give you a run rundown, guys. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a high quality version of this survey. Kaya hindi ko siya post dito. But uh, just to give you an idea, so eto yung numbers. Okay, zoom zoom natin. So, I think numbers, uh, na natin. 
Ito yung mga numbers. So, number three pa rin si Len Robredo. Uh, and then, malayang malayo, single digits na lang si Aimee Marcos at 5%. Manny Pacquiao at 3%. So, halos wala. Uh, si um, Risa is at around 1%. And then, Martin Romualdez is not even 1%. Alright. So, this is more or less consistent dun sa mga earlier surveys na nakita natin sa SWS. Whereby, uh, it's really Sarah, Rafi, and... Lenny looks as look uh, looks like the third uh, option here. Now the interesting thing for me here is is yung breakdown, yung breakdown. Now obviously we had separate vlogs. This whole Risa versus Lenny thing. My sense is if Lenny steps back and pushes for Risa, then Risa, I think our numbers will push up. And perhaps it's better that uh, I, I'm sure hindi sila tatapos sa buy. There's there's no way that Risa and Lenny will run together. So there's a very high possibility that with the margin of error three to five percent. Uh, if one of them doesn't run, especially if Lenny doesn't run, a lot of these points, double digit chat list, will go to Riza Antiveros, right? Not all, but at least a significant part of it, depending on how well Lenny will uh, will endorse, how sincerely, how consistently, how sustainably endorses Riza Antiveros. And of course, a lot will also depend on how Riza Antiveros is going to position herself in the coming years. Pero ito, um, so halo statistically tied ngayon si Rafi Tulfa at saka Sara Duterte which is significantly different kung maalala nyo, more than a year ago dun sa SWS survey, um, ang laki ng agwat no? between Sara Duterte. So back then, Sara Duterte was at around um, was at uh, around a third of the vote and then si Rafi Tulfo was uh, below 20%, right? Below 20%. So Rafi Tulfo went from, uh, you know, low teens number like 15 16 17 18 20% now he's at 35% right so that's a significant significant jump so NCR he's at 41% well ahead of everyone else so 26% lang si Sara Duterte 14% si Lenny aba si Amy dito siya pinakamataas ay hindi, hindi rin sa balance Luzon 6% so ang ang, ang laki ng guwat ni Rafi Tulfo pagdating sa National Capital Region sa balance Luzon it's um it is almost the same in uh, pagdating sa Aguat. So, 14 points spread difference. Si Rafi Tulfo at 37%. 23% naman si Sara Duterte. So, that's huge, huge double digits. So, with the margin of error 3 to 5%, you're looking at, uh, at potentially up to 20 points difference between the two. Lenny's at around 13%. So, Lenny around 14, 13%. So, Lenny's actually stronger in NCR than the other regions. We're going to go to Mindanao soon because that's really where the big difference comes in. So in Visayas, uh, Rafi is even stronger at 46% and 20% lang si Sara Duterte, 18% si Lenny. So interestingly, Sara is pretty is relatively weaker because of Visayas. 46% si Rafi, 16% si Lenny. In fact, Lenny and Sara Duterte are almost statistically tied with the 3 to 5% margin of error pagdating sa Visayas. Now, this is where Sara Duterte keeps her competitiveness. In Mindanao, Sara Duterte is 72%. Now, this is not the 95 to 100% support that she gets dun sa, dun sa mga satisfaction ratings niya. But still, she has still cornered the Mindanao vote. It's 72%. Rafi Tulfo is only at 18%. And Lenny is I mean, 2%, which is, you know, with the margin of error could be even zero, right? So... Sarah is really weak, Savisayas, comparatively. She's just 20% versus 18% of Lenny and 46% of Rafi Tulfo. In Balance Luzon, she's slightly more competitive at 23%, up to 26% in the National Capital Region. Tulfo goes all the way up to 41% in the National Capital Region and Lenny at 14%. So that's quite an interesting uh, dynamic. Where Sarah comes in strong is in Mindanao, 72% versus only 18% for Rafi Tulfo and Lenny at 2%. So this is the, this is, at, at, kung, mga, kung Ross Belts was for Trump in, 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 in 2016 elections, this is, um, ito yung, or Florida, I mean, if I can put it, this is the Florida of Sarah Duterte, right? Um, although Florida, you know, is, 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 is even Florida is, you know, as red as it has become after being quite purple for quite some time. But I'm just giving an idea of, ito na yung bailiwick niya talaga. Kitang-kita mo, ang laki nung agwat ni, ni Sara from everyone else. 72%. Pag sinama mo lahat ng mga ibang candidates or potential candidates, they're not even um, a third, right, of, of, of her votes and base. So it's the Mindanao vote that is pushing her up. 
and keep bringing her very, very competitive. In Visayas, she's statistically tied with Lenny, which is quite, quite interesting things uh, to look at. Now, in terms of uh, social economic class, ABC, which is very small, you know, I mean, ilang percent lang, single digit lang ABC, 5%, right? Um, so ABC, interestingly, Rafi Tulfo is the strongest at 36%. Again, ang laki na, what, 14 points. 14 points kumpara kay Sara Duterte, who's at 22%. Now, interestingly, Lenny and Sara Duterte are statistically tied among the ABC voters. So remember, the ABC are the wealthiest, most educated uh, Filipinos based on the I mean, I mean, I'm not saying they're the best. I'm just saying in terms of just statistical. I know. Uh, but they're, they're, it's a very small, small uh, portion of the overall voters. So you're looking at a few percentage there. And ABC, to be honest, as I say, it's really C. Because A and B are inside Das Marinas, Forbes, and yung mga ganun na area na hindi naman maabutan ng mga, uh, ng mga Pulse Asia. Yung mga Sobrang malabo magkaroon ng uh, malawakan na survey sa mga areas niya. Di ba? Um, so this is really C. So interesting, if you look at the Filipino quote unquote middle class, and we can have a long discussion and debate about what middle class is, majority of them actually are, or actually see, uh, the largest portion are for Rafi Tulfo. And you put Rafi and Lenny together, that's around uh, you know 50%. But interestingly, Sara still has more than Lenny among ABC. So the idea that the middle class and then all are just for opposition or for pink, it misses the point. It misses the point. Actually, just in the, in fact, in the last two elections, both BBM and Sara also did better in the ABC, also with Digong no? uh, in 2016. Um, I'm not, I'm not talking about the visual things you see. Mga people who are like, yes, marami tao pumunta sa, you know, sa mga rallies and all of that. But uh, ilan tao yan? 300,000, 1 million, right? So, so you're, you're missing the millions of others, right? Um, whose, whose vote is reflected in the, in the final tally and also reflected in the scientific surveys. Now, sa Class E, ito yung mga pinakamahirap natin mga kababayan. A lot of them in rural areas. Um... 46% is for Rafi Tulfo. So, kitang-kita nyo, ang lakas ng dating ng mga Tulfos, especially Rafi Tulfo, dun sa mga pinakamahirap natin ng mga kaubayan. And I think this has a lot to do with this image of the Tulfos as a kind of a savior, as a kind of a tough man, as a kind of a real Robin Hood. I'm not Robin Hood. Or, you know, like, he's, he's, our, he's, he's gonna be our fighter, right, for justice and all of that. So, dito medyo mataas uh, ang numbers niya. Uh, Sara is relatively weaker at 28% and only 10% for, for Lenny here. But where is Sara again? So two things actually are pushing up Sara Duterte's numbers. One is in Mindanao, which is 72%, well, way ahead of 18% of Rafi Tulfo. But the other one is D, which is more or less, quote-unquote, Masa, and a significant portion of the Philippine urban poor. Uh, this is actually the biggest... Uh, section of our voters, I think between 55 to 60 percent, based on the earlier numbers I, I saw. So even if Kulela si or uh, ang laki na guat ni Rafi Tulfo kay Sara pagdating sa E and ABC 36 to 22, 46 to 28, pagdating sa D, which is the biggest portion of the voters, 55 to 60 percent, Sara is ahead of Rafi very slightly within margin of error is 37 to 33. But because the D is the biggest portion of the voters, uh, yung few points advantage ni Sarah John, tumulong sa kanya para makahabol. Para makahabol. To keep the race competitive at more or less statistically tied. Right? But Rafi Tulfo is now, at least based on two surveys I know, two authorita authoritative surveys I know, um, is, is now the front runner. Is now the front runner. Just as his younger brother Erwin is also the front runner uh, for the Senate race. Obviously, different dynamics because in the Senate, 12 can come in. So it's a question of who's number one. While in the presidency, uh, presidential elections, only one person can win. So Tulfos essentially topping both. This is Pulse Asia. Uh, I know also in another authority survey, it's the same. So Tulfos are topping both the Senate race and also 2028 race, which is, again, quite, quite interesting. So yung 60% unit team, whatever, nakita natin in the last elections, that has essentially splintered. And if you paksinama mo yung numbers ni Rafi at numbers ni uh, Sarah, you can see that yung 60%-ish na pumunta sa uni team uh, in 2022 is now clearly split between these two candidates with the rest of the candidates sharing the 30-40% left out there. Now, there are movements here. There's dynamism here. There are many, many things that could change, but the trajectory is very important. 
So Tulfo went from a distant second now to number one. Lenny has kept his, her position as number three, but as I said, things could change if she doesn't run. It remains to be seen if the numbers go to Riza or numbers go to Rafi. Uh, who knows, diba? Yun mga bagay na dapat titignan natin. So marami mga moving parts dito. But then again, ang trend lines po ay klarong klaro dito na the Tulfos are in a position of ascendancy and mukhang very strategic and effective yung, yung ginawa ni Rafi Tulfo na hindi niya hinihead on, inaaway si Sara Duterte. And she's, he's leaving it to the others to do it while ang focus niya ay dun sa mga issues kung saan uh, well, at least he comes off as a champion of the people. No? Whether ito yung mga issue ng teachers, students, uh, depth ed issues, whether ito yung China's uh, presence in our critical infrastructure, whether ito ay uh, whether ito ay Whether ito ay, um, and I'm going to media to. Tumatawag sa kinang live stream natin, magte-text na lang kasi kayo eh. Anyway, um, yes, a long way to go, correct? But I'm just saying, the trend line is clear. Hindi na front runner si Sara Duterte. Hindi na siya shoe in for 2028. It's now a competitive race and so far the Tulfos are in a pole position. Um, Again, we don't know what's going to happen by 2028. A lot can change until then. But one thing that is very clear right now is that nawawala yung grip ng mga Dutertes. Uh, forget about now, but even for potential succession question, well, not potential, but constitutional, constitutionally mandated succession question come 2020. So that's that's very, very important. Now, to uh, to keep this very short, because I don't know how to other things. Um, one of my problems doon sa mga opposition analysis, mga ganun, is palatis sinasabi, ah, fake news yan, disinformation yan. Well, last time I checked, it's not like nag fake news sa mga tulfos kaya sikat sila. We all, we all know very well bakit ang lakas ng kanilang appeal sa taong bayan. Because there's this perception that they're very helpful and they're filling in the gaps as far as our justice system, our broken justice system is concerned. My good friend, historian Lisandro Claudia has also done a fantastic job of analyzing how, sa, at least para sa kanya, mga tulfos should have been actually peaking much earlier than now. In fact, nauna pa sila kay Digong in terms of building this kind of macho, uh, you know, f- you know, justice man image at the national level, at the national level. So, nung nanalo si Digong ilang president in 2016, I naturally always thought as the Tulfos as that if, if since hindi na sila naging precursor um, or potentially precursors, you know, psychologically, politically, but also electorally speaking, successors. Yun yung nakita natin. So, this is where, hindi pwede idaan na lang lahat sa disinformation, disinformation, disinformation. You also have to, lo- to understand voters. You have to understand the demand side of politics. Hindi pa- pwede yung supply side. Supply side is what? You're always looking at information fed to the people, media, what the politician do. But you also have to understand what people want based on their needs, circumstances, and their perceptions of what they need as far as leadership is concerned. Right? Again, as I said, uh, we can have a long debate about what we believe is best for Senate. Obviously, uh, in theory, best people for Senate are people like uh, Dean Jokno, no? who not only understands the law very well and the Constitution, but also understands um, the pangailangan natin sa legislatura. But when it comes to the voters, you have to, you have to understand from the perspective of the voters, from the perspective of the voters, yung mga binaboto nila sa Senado, or presidency for that matter, are people that they believe will help them, will save them, right? Um, and, 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 and the thing is, because ang baba ng kumpiyansa ng tao sa ating demokrasya, dahil hindi ito nag-deliver, I mean, after all of those years of reformist administrations, ang dami mga Pilipino na may problema sa hostisya, may mga daming problema sa due process, ang dami mga kaso na hindi resolved, and dami mga pre-trial detainees, ang kulang ang sobrang konti yung investments sa judiciary natin. So ang dami problema sa ating justice system all those years, even when yung mga reformists ay nasa, nasa pwesto. So, so naturally, you understand that a lot of Filipinos have lost confidence and trust dun sa quote-unquote democratic institutions. It's, it's, so it's really that frustration that has made them more and more amenable to have someone like Duterte or someone like even the Marcoses back. 
But the Tulfas have been there for quite some time and they have been constantly exposing human shortcomings or supposedly sh exposing human shortcomings sa ating uh, law enforcement system, sa ating justice system. And for all criticism we can make of their approach, their tactics, their tone, whatever. Um, and by the way, they never called for EJK. They never called for uh, dictatorship. They never went against our democratic system openly and all. And please check also in the clarification that Ravi Tulfo made when I asked him. Um, when you look at all of those factors, when you look at all of those factors, you can see because walang tiwalang mga ating kababayan sa ating mga institusyon, ang nangyari dito is naghahanap sila ng mga uh, figures, savior figures. And the Tulfos, with all the macho-ness, with all of the proactive interventions, with all of the good positioning that, that, that Rafi has been doing in Senate, the good positioning that Erwin Tulfo did as DSWD secretary, etc., that has just endeared them more and more to the people. Not to mention yung relatability, uh, perceptions of compassion. At, uh, at tama eh, you, you know, like charisma is always a combination of fear and compassion, right? Fear in a sense that ito ay matapang na tao, he's gonna fight for us, and there's kind of a reverence for that person, but also compassion, meaning relatable itong tao na to, and he's gonna fight for me, or she's gonna fight for me, but of course, Unfortunately, mm -hmm. major patriarchal tie and all of that, uh, our, our, our notions of strength are very male-oriented, male-dominated, very macho in that sense. So for all criticism of toxic masculinity, all criticism of tone and everything that you may have, the reality is that more and more Filipinos see the tulfos as their answer to the shortcomings and defaults in our system, which is what, kaya nga, ito yung parate ko sinisabi, if you don't take care of your democracy, this is what's gonna happen. Because hindi pwede hanggang salita lang, hindi pwede sa, uh, hanggang mga abstract concept lang, hindi pwede hanggang mga batas lang, tapos hindi na-implement. If you do that, people lose confidence in democracy. And there's so many scholarly works that show Filipinos are ambivalent towards our democracy. And therefore, they're open to more authoritarian leaders. I cited Pew Survey, among others, Gallup Poll. I've showed throughout all these years na more and more Filipinos are open to authoritarian leaders because napakababa yung kanilang kumpiyansa sa demokrasya. And I cannot blame them, right? All those years na we had reformist administration, yes, there were many good improvements. I admit it. But the reality is that hindi tayo nagkaroon ng inclusive development. The reality is that yung mga trapos na continue to dominate the political system. Noong 2015, up to 80% of the Congress was dominated by dynasties. Noong 2011, up to 76% of newly created growth was taken on by 40 richest families. So even in the best reformist era we had, which is Pinoy, you still had tremendous amount of concentration of wealth and power, which alienated a lot of people, not to mention all of the shortcomings we had in our justice system. So unfortunately, nahihirapan pa rin ang opposition to gain back the confidence of people. But as I said, that's where Riza comes in. And I think Riza has been doing some interesting stuff here. But as we see, hindi pa rin klaro kasi sino talaga ng, ano eh, sino talaga ng, uh, uh, ano ng opposition. So that's a completely different discussion we can have later on. But in the meantime, you have to understand, you cannot just attack the voters. You cannot just demean them. You cannot just question their literacy, etc. You have to understand what made them so frustrated, right, that they're open to these kinds of leaders, right? And what are what are the things that these leaders are providing that makes them amenable to people? Kaya nga may term na populist voters. Yung mga voters mismo naghahanap ng populist figures to solve problems that they felt weak institutions, weak democratic institutions have not been able to solve, right? So again, this is a call for reflections and proper understanding before we, we jump into judgments, right? So I think this is what's important to keep in mind. On that note, thank you very much, Makameta. I'll try to get back to you once we have clear image of the data and numbers that we have based on the reports we're seeing. And then hopefully we can also have folks from Pulse Asia, uh, Okta, and other survey agencies who know a thing or two about these things to also join us and have discussions about this latest service. On that note, thank you very much. God bless and talk to you soon. Maraming salamat. <laughs>